talk a little bit about um, your passion for music and how you saw that develop in your life. For example, did you have a lot of music in your home when you were a kid? We didn't have a, a whole lot of music. My brother played clarinet, older brother, and when I wanted to play, I wanted to start at 12 in the band. I said I wanted to play sax, but parents said, well, we have a clarinet. Um, but we had about this many records, maybe. We had a hi-fi, one of those big old hi-fis. And uh, one of those records was Benny Goodman, a, a red one. And uh, so I started playing clarinet, and I was playing that Benny Goodman record, and I got hooked real early. Uh, we also had a, a, a sampler that had Maynard Ferguson, it had Clark Terry, it had a, a great sample. So we had about four jazz records. And, uh, and, uh, but I, I got hooked early on. My first band director, Bob Crosby, was a great clarinet, sax, flute player, jazz player. So early on, that's, that was 12. By 14, I knew I wanted to be a musician. And uh, by 15, I was gigging enough where I quit mowing lawns and doing all the jobs I had been doing. I was making decent little money. So, yeah, I was very passionate. I was, by 14, 15, I was practicing four hours a day, and I quit all the sports that I used to do to practice. It was a decision. Quit soccer, quit tennis, quit baseball. You know, not easy decision, but music was that much for me. We had a great radio station on, in Tampa, Florida, USF. Um, shoot, I can't remember the DJ, but he just played a great spectrum of all the stuff. So that was a big part of my education. And my first private teacher when I was 13 was a great, great musician. And uh, he, he gave me so much extra time and everything. And uh, he swung, he was a cross between Montana, he sounded like Ben Webster and Coleman Hawkins, and he swung, and he played bass and piano and everything. What was his name? His name was Junie Farrell, and uh, he was so great. You know, went to the local store and just lucked out and got this teacher. And then as a, as a year or two went by, he asked the owner. The owner was a sax player, and he was Junie's student also, had been. And Junie said, you know, I'd like to take Jody to the house so I can give him more time. And Junie said, go ahead. Uh, and so it was, it was great. Hmm. Lucky. That's very cool. Yeah. Where did you grow up? In Tampa, Florida. Okay. Yeah. And my, my first two band directors were great jazz players. Like I told you, the first one. The second one, uh, Prof Rodriguez, we call him Prof, boogie woogie piano player, burning. And I'd have to beg him. Come on, prof. Can we can we play? Can I blow with you know? Because uh, I was already right away. I was into improvising. Hmm. Right away. I don't know why, hmm. but that's what I loved. That's amazing because a lot of people have to go through a whole process before they get there. Yeah. How do you think it came so easy to you? <sighs> no, no idea why. But I listened a lot. You know, I, I would do my lessons. That first band director was a perfectionist like no one I have ever met. So that beginning band was one of the best I'd been in. You had to give your lessons. So I practiced that, but then I'd always goof around and goof around. And oh, I know, I just remembered. I, I played recorder the year before in sixth grade. And I would sit in front of the TV. We'd watched probably more TV than we should have. My little brother was four years younger. My older brother was already out of the house. I'd sit and watch TV and I'd play recorder and all the commercials that would come on, I'd be trying to cop the melody. And that recorder would go missing every once in a while and I'd be, where's my recorder? And just a few years ago, my brother told me, my little brother told me he'd hide it all the time, drive him nuts. So I think, you know, developing my ear a little bit, trying to play stuff on recorder in all kind of keys, it works your ear. Another yeah. thing that's interesting is, um, it's fun to think back at the teachers that we've had that mm -hmm. really are motivators, right? And influences. Mm -hmm. And it's hard, I think, sometimes to put down what you've learned from them because it's, in some respects, it's vast. 
Do you have that same sense? Well, with Junie, um, one thing was very different and really important, and it's very different from what people learn today, but he, we would do our lessons, our technical things, and our scales and arpeggios and stuff like that, and then he would bring out a tune. He had written the melody to, let's say, take the A train or all the tunes that I ended up doing when I was playing weddings and all that, tunes I needed to learn anyway. He'd have the melody written out, but he never wrote a chord change on there, and he never told me the changes. So I'd play the melody, he'd be playing piano, and then I'd solo. So he, he taught me, you know, I had a sheet with G7 chord, I'd arpeggiate and stuff, but then when we played the tunes and everything, we would never talk about changes. And I'd come out of my lesson, and he'd always tell my mom or something, he said, boy, he's got a good ear. And I never thought anything of it, you know, but, but then later when I got to college and started learning, you know, really shedding the chord changes, I realized I had a leg up because I had been already using my ear. So that, that thing about ear versus intellect and chord changes, chord changes can really hamstring you because now you have this framework you're trying to stay in that's not just pure melody. So, so that was one great thing he did. And, you know, my probably my other most influential teacher was Joe Viola at Berkeley College of Music. Uh, and he was just like Buddha. You know, everybody who studied with him will tell you. There was something about him, so peaceful and gentle, but you know, we stayed on, on this little oboe etude, the first line of it for a couple of months, teaching me about phrasing, and he changed my embouchure when I got there, and things like that, so big overhaul when I first got there. So I played long tones almost exclusively for a few months, trying to change a habit. Um, and then I've had lucky so many good teachers. George Garzon, who is, who is now a Jody Jazz endorser, a great friend, and uh, we've done all kind of projects together, but he was one of my teachers there. And I loved, when I was a kid, I loved Benny Goodman, Boots Randolph, Ornette Coleman, Eric Dolphy, I just went around my strange little thing. So George was into, he was known to be into the avant-garde and he made it okay for us to do, to really try things uh, because there's a lot of, you know, neo-beboppers, some kind of conservative and conservatism in, in schools now where you're really plugged into this bebop track. Mm. But with George, he was, it was like permission to, to be out, too, if you wanted. So it was, that worked really well. John Laporta, he used to call me Toby. I don't know why. But the first year, advanced improv at Berkeley, the first year he was so on me. Come on, Toby, listen to Bach. Since we're playing a, a minor, you know, we're playing a minor tune, listen to Bach. He wouldn't say, go play the, that learn the right chord scales and things on a minor 2-5. He said, go listen to Bach. And I'd have to go, what is he talking about? And I finally figured it out. I finally figured it out, playing more of the natural minor scale as opposed to a, a Dorian, mm -hmm. if you want to get real technical. But so he was on me all the time that first year. And then the next year, a buddy of mine was in the class too. And it was bad for our friendship because he would say, do like Toby does. <laughs> He'd say, listen to Toby. And, and I wasn't playing much any better than him, really, but I don't know what happened. But <laughs> he said, do like Toby. So we laughed about that many years later. Uh, not necessarily at the time. <laughs> no, no, really not. <laughs> but a lot of good teachers. That's fantastic. So overall, what, do you, what are your thoughts about... Um, Berkeley, as far as its direction and and how it um, how it achieves its goals with its students. Well, I'm I'm up there at least once a year, so I've been observing and and what they've done they've they have a a pretty rigorous uh, audition process now where there's only a certain percentage that are getting in, mm -hmm. and uh, so the level is is quite high. The level when I was there 
was quite high too, but there was, you could get in if you paid the money, actually. That was, this was in 1980. But in my class was Donald Harrison, Branford Marcellus, Wallace Roney, uh, Jeff Tame Watts, um, Terry Lynn Carrington, Diana Krall. Uh, it was, and it goes on, there were a lot of great players. So there were plenty of great players and then there was just all kind of levels. But uh, they have this global institute now. They are turning out some players and kids these days, they, they're getting better and better. I was, last night I was at the Tipitina's Foundation doing a clinic and uh, Donald Harrison is the teacher. Mm -hmm. So they get to see Donald Harrison almost every week and uh, these kids are just normal high school kids but they're all playing, they all know their changes, they all have good sounds and I told them all you can all have it, you just have to really just bear down and practice. And uh, but, but the the level of playing worldwide has gone up so much. Mm. Worldwide, it used to be you had to be in the United States to hear the best players. Now, Europe has amazing players. Asia is coming up super fast, super fast. Year by year, you can tell. Wow. Yeah, that's. Do you remember getting your first saxophone? Sure, I had to mow a lot of lawns for it because I, yeah, I, I got the clarinet because we had it. And so I bought, uh, I can't remember how much it was, it might have been 250. It was used, it was ugly, and it was not very good. <laughs> but it was close enough, <laughs> close enough for jazz. And uh, so I was happy with that. And then I heard in eighth grade, uh, somebody told me, well, there's, I heard about this girl selling a Mark VI, Alto. And I had been reading Downbeat magazine, and that was my thing that got Berkeley in my mind. And also, I'd look at these pictures of the Henri Selmer saxophone, and it'd be those beauty shots, and they'd just be, ooh. And so I went to this girl's house. She was a college girl. She was the original owner, opened up this beautiful, rich, purple velvet, and the sax was in shiny. It was, there it was. Henri Selmer, it was, oh, the girl was beautiful, and <laughs> and the saxophone was just as beautiful, and uh, so I got it for a great price, and, and that's been my horn all my life. I'm, I've worn through some, some of the metal, and we've built it back up, but I've, I recently I stopped playing it. Uh, it's, I bring it out. It's kind of in semi-retirement, uh, some other, because I go all over. I haven't felt like taking it around lately, but I found a great substitute um, and I'm friends with all the the instrument makers good friends because we're at these shows all the time and and I love these guys so I want to stay independent and stay friends with everybody so I have a, a horn that's uh, not known in this country yet <laughs> and but really good hmm. so right. down in Tampa um, what were some of the music stores that you would go to when you were a kid yeah that was a mainly it was this Paragon Music, Dicky Ramora, people know him, I think, and uh, this was probably early 70s, 75 or so, and uh, like I say, he was a sax player, and he had studied with Junie, and he had a little band, and so he had a soft spot for horn players, um, and uh, there was a Kutro's music store, but that was downtown, I didn't get down there too much. But I remember the first music store we went to when we were getting my brother's clarinet fixed, uh, repaired, getting ready. And I just remember the smells of the instruments and uh, like opening the case, there was a certain smell. And we had a trombone that a cousin had given us, and it just the smell. And so I remember that and all the little things, the cork grease and little, little stuff like that. I have vivid sensory memories of all that. So, um, tell me a little bit about how you came to the music industry. How did that come about? Pure serendipity. Uh, I was in New York City and I had a pretty successful career as a professional musician. And uh, I, uh, I was director of a jazz department, I adjunct professor at his college. Uh, 
taught a lot of private lessons, did all kind of gigs. So I was cool, you know, but, and I was, it was satisfying enough uh, where I had a mix of, of jazz things that were interesting and then commercial jobs. Uh, but I, I, for some reason I started doing this um, Artist's Way book. I, and I, I did a TEDx talk not too long ago about this. And it tells the, the kind of the whole story, but um, I, in through this book, you're working on your creativity and not just creativity in your field, which is the important thing about it was I got creative writing and photographing and doing things that I never thought I could do. And uh, also acting, investing in yourself more. Musicians have a lot of uh, practice at being careful with money just like maybe actors who aren't famous and well up. You, gotta, you, gotta, you never know when your next job is coming. You're, you're, people, when I was a kid, in those days when I was so passionate, band directors would say, Jody, if you're going to be a musician, don't get married, don't have a family, or else you'll have to become a band director like me. I knew I didn't want to be a band director, but, and, and a lot of everyone else would say, do anything, study anything but music go to college, study, be a, an accountant. And you can, you know, so you have something to fall back on in case music doesn't work out. And I didn't listen to that either. I knew if I was going to be a professional, I had to practice enough to be good enough. So, so it worked out for me. But those messages are with you in some kind of, they're in there. And this, through these exercises that this book takes you through, it really freed me up. So I went down to a uh, IAJE conference in New Orleans, which is where we are today. And so this city is so special to me. Um, and it was, I was paying my own money. It was about $1,600. I lived in New York City. And it was just a real change for me to do that. Um, and the conference was the first one I was ever at. It was tremendous. And it really touched me got me back remembering the passion that I had when I was a kid, seeing all these concerts, clinics, talks, and I met Santi Runyon. Now, Santi Runyon was the teacher of my teacher, Junie Farrell, mm. and Santi has had this energy that was incredible, and uh, he was called Santi because he was famous for giving things away, and he gave me a little invention, and, and we talked and everything, and when I got back to New York, I wrote a little story about meeting him and this conference. I sent it to him, and uh, he invited me to come down to Lafayette, Louisiana and play his 93rd birthday party. So I, I said, sure. And again, in the past, I probably wouldn't have expended that money, but I wanted to be around him. And uh, so I played his party, and, and it was a blast. I had picked one of his mouthpieces. He was a famous mouthpiece maker. And I picked one of his mouthpieces to play at his party so as to be polite. And it was, it was a pretty good. It was OK. A few months later, I called him and I said, can you, can you, I don't know. I said, I can't play the mouthpiece anymore because it's, it's not free enough. It doesn't have enough bottom in the sound. And he said, come on back and I'll reface it for you. And hadn't it been? It, if it hadn't been for his energy, I probably wouldn't have gone. But, and I was open to these things at this time because of this mode I was in. By the way, that, that $1,600 that I spent, things like this were happening all the time, uh, synchronicities. I, I mentioned to the director of this school where I was teaching at that uh, I went down to this thing, and it was really cool. She says, uh, let, write something up on that. And we might have a little fund, a teacher enrichment fund, and boom, I got a check for $1,600. So things were coming back to me like that all the time. And uh, so I went down, Santi refaced it, which is customized with uh, a different facing curve and taking out some, just a little bit of stuff inside. And I said, wow. And he said, that's what I did for Marshall Royal from Count Basie Band. I did the same thing for him. Uh, and I said, I love it. So he said, well, Jody, we can make that for you and call it Jody Jazz. <laughs> and I thought, mm. I said, thank you very much. And to myself, I thought, that's, that's a goofy name. But 
I'm not going to say anything. I figured I would sell a few to students, and kind of that would be the end of it. But there's a Sax Forum that got word of this, and people started buying a few. So I went down to the factory um, about seven, eight times a year and started developing that that little facing curve on, on other models besides this was on the alto and we did the tenor and the baritone and the soprano. Uh, and uh, I'd work in the factory all day with Santi in his and studio and uh, Santi always said the secret to his success was two bourbon cokes a day and we had three a uh, few times. <laughs> but he was incredible and he was still playing great, 93, 94, 95, when he was 95 we were out uh, at a jazz brunch and he blew this huge sound somewhere over the rainbow. He had played in the 20s in uh, uh, Chicago, 30s in the Chicago theater. Well, during the depression he had a job seven days a week and he used to do arrangements. He made, he made money but he was one of the first guys to get into plastics in mouthpiece making mm. and uh, he had studied from one of the original guys, Eric Brand, who kind of developed this whole system for measuring. And so, with uh, Santi's crew, I was able to really learn a lot. And with Santi, you know, it's I just it's drawing it out of him. We'd we'd play a little bit, hang, have a sip, uh, and I'd say, "How do you do this or that?" And uh, he let me prototype my first mouthpiece. So so I had that model from him. And then I said, could I prototype my own metal? So he let me do that in his factory. You know, to, to tool up and start a business in your own factory, that's, that's something else. So I had this great advantage. And all, what I did, I said, I, just, I saw the opportunity. I did make a website, make a company, went for it, started advertising. Downbeat, uh, Richie Duraney was the first guy. I could, can, you know when you're driving somewhere and something happens, you can always remember where I was driving. I was in Florida driving across the, the Tampa Bay. Richie Duraney from Downbeat calls me and so reach out to, to advertise. And uh, so they're, they're great friends and uh, that's been a great relationship. But again, I, was, I had the confidence and not the self-doubt or no fear type of thing. Go for it. Advertise. Take pictures. Write the website go to trade shows. I always tried to seem a little bigger or a lot bigger than I was from the big beginning. And uh, my biggest surprise in the music industry, because being a musician all this time, I had, I guess, dealing with club owners or who knows why, but I had this perception of business owners as greedy, soulless, you know, people. And then I get into this music industry, this music products industry, and I've made great friends and store owners, from store owners to other manufacturers to the nicest people, as you know. Um, that was a, a real surprise, a pleasant, pleasant surprise. So where is Santi's uh, factory? Santi's factory is in Opelousas, Louisiana, and uh, I had a whole life down there when I went. At, Sometimes I had a girlfriend, and I had you know I'd go there seven times a year. I'd I'd be doing gigs. <laughs> I'd get up, work in the factory from six thirty to three thirty, go hang out with Santi, maybe do a gig. I mean, it was, it was and then I prototyped my first uh, my first mouthpiece from scratch down there in a machine shop, and that, that's the one I have a patent on the DV, and uh, so I knew I had to diversify a little bit because. You know, if you have all your eggs in one basket and something happens in that basket, you're in trouble. So, so that was part of the diversification. And uh, when we moved to Savannah, Georgia, seven years ago, that's when we started the factory. And now we make everything there. Slowly brought all that in. We have three CNC machines, and it's a whole different ball game. But it's, it's you know, you need to control your own destiny. And uh, quality control is a big thing in this industry, in the, the mouthpiece business. And I believe we're actually in a golden era right now of mouthpieces. So there, there are a lot of competent, good makers out there and models. So 
of course I feel, you know, I'm, I tweak mine until they're just perfect for me, so I feel mine are the best. But, um, but, but I'll, I'll say there are, I believe the industry is going for the better, mm. as some things seem to go for the worse sometimes, but I think we're, we're going for the better now. What is different about yours? Well, it is difficult to patent a mouthpiece. It's like patenting a golf club, but, uh, but I was trying to solve a problem how to make a mouthpiece with a good, enough projection that you can play live gigs. As, as music has gone, progressed, you know, think of a tennis racket. The old days it was wood, it was got strings. It had nowhere near the tension it does now and it was a lot heavier. So now tennis rackets are light and they're very powerful. A, a modern tennis player, his ball goes so much faster. So in music, as music became more amplified and louder, wind instruments that don't have knobs had to figure out how they can compete. And so chambers inside of mouthpieces got smaller, brighter and louder, but shriller more shrill, less beauty, less bottom, fullness, less harmonics in the sound. So my quest was to make a mouthpiece with fullness that had that power. And to make the power, you got to make the chamber smaller. So I, could, I couldn't figure out how to do it, frankly. And uh, I was reading The Da Vinci Code, the novel, and they talk about the golden mean proportions, or the Fibonacci series of numbers. So this is a proportion found throughout nature, and it's, it happened to be in the Stradivarius violin, in, in natural things like the human body, the dolphin. Um, and so I took my, one of my mouthpieces and I divided it by 1.618. And the first measurement I got actually could correspond to the normal window. I got another measurement that was longer. And uh, I started thinking about opening up this extra part under the reed. So essentially, that's the, all the, the proportions in the mouthpiece follow this, these proportions. And the, the, the main difference is opening up this part under the reed that's usually not open. And uh, gives it this deep Dexter Gordon thing. So I always say it's like a shot of Dexter. And, but the way we manufactured it, the very thin rails, thin tip rail, um, we put that curve on with a CNC machine which is super accurate. And the curve of the, of the way the reed vibrates, it depended upon that curve, super, super important. So in prototyping, I can be working, working, it's not, 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 change the curve, change the curve, finally get the right curve, bing. So, so that, that's a very special mouthpiece. Uh, and it's, it's made a, a big difference for, for our company. And what's the material it's made out of? It's brass, 24 karat gold plated. It's a real beautiful mouthpiece. I had a big full page ad in Downbeat, and I get a call. And that mouthpiece looks like a dolphin. I got to have the mouthpiece. And I made the forehead, the beak, purposely. I was studying, you know, in this time. I, every time I was on a plane, I was studying all the airplanes around, looking at that. And I was looking at dolphins because they, and so I tried to make that beak just like a dolphin. And he's the only guy who ever saw it. And he kept, he said his name and, and I wasn't getting it right away. I realized this was Prince Lachey, who's on Eric Dolphy records. And I was a kid, I was on Eric Dolphy freak. And, and I knew, I said, you're Prince Lachey? He said, yeah. He said, so, so he got the baritone, he was an endorser. He passed away, but um, that was one of the thrills. Mm -hmm. Another thrill was getting to hang out with Ornette for a couple days, my other, one of my boyhood heroes. And, I had amazing time hanging out with Ornette, playing, swapping horns, sitting on his love seat, listening to music, and uh, I was letting him listen to one of my CDs, and he says, you know, you should play this music where they drink beer. <laughs> I love Ornette. <laughs> Nobody's ever said that to me. <laughs> He's so obvious. Yeah. 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 That's why he's a genius. <laughs> so what has the response been? Well, we uh, I think we started on early early on 
with these models, people knew that I was a player, that I was play testing every mouthpiece, that I was really careful. What I did with those Runyon mouthpieces that had my Jody Jazz stamp on them, and I, I was a fanatic, you know, about the quality. Cause, and we, we changed some things that they did, and I worked so much down in the factory. Um, so people, and, and my mantra was free blowing. Every time I play, guys would come in, in New York when I was still there, great players, they might come with an old vintage mouthpiece. Okay, that's, there's a certain part of the market where they might pay 1000 to $2,000 for something made in the 50s that you can't get anymore. And uh, I would play all these sought after vintage mouthpieces. Okay, hey, can I play your mouthpiece? Can I measure it? Every one of them was super free blowing. Hmm. That's like when you play and it's just, yeah, come on in, give me your air, welcome. That's what I like. Some people like resistance. Some people like to be squeezed a little bit when they blow into it. It feels like this to me. I like, come on in, and open arms. So, so that's another thing, a hallmark of our pieces was one was the quality and everything was free blowing. And, and me just showing up to all the shows uh, a lot, you know? Marketing, too. I gotta let people know about it. Santi said, if you don't market, it's like winking in the dark to a girl. <laughs> um, so, so I think uh, I mean the response has been great. We're, I think we we have a very good position in the market now, and pretty respected brand, and we're truly global. Uh, I've, I've got six overseas trips this year, so you know, we. Uh, you have to be, because now, for example, Europe, the, the currency is getting weaker, our dollar is getting stronger, we're going to have less exporters are going to have a problem in Europe this year. Um, so we have to think, and we're in a hiring mode, we just hired a couple more employees, uh, we just expanded our factory, so we're out there shaking the trees. Okay. So what year did the product come out? 2000. Wow. This is our 15 year anniversary. That's fantastic. Yeah. And tell me about some of the models that have come since. Sure. Well, we got a hard rubber model. That's our number one in quantity, our number one seller. And it's a straight ahead jazz mouthpiece, round chamber. We uh, just came out with a new mouthpiece called the Jet, which is a brighter mouthpiece. Um, but it has come neck and neck already with the hard rubber. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a a hit and uh, so when we made the DV that was meant to be a powerful bright mouthpiece with body and then I had certain people my friends in New York and Boston would say I love that mouthpiece but it's too bright so we made the DV New York and made a very deep chamber and now you can sound like Stan Getz if you want but you still have this very free blowing and then some people said I like that DV and I like that DV New York, but that's too bright and that's too dark. Don't. So, <laughs> so we made the DV Chicago, and in that we did a real cool thing in the chamber with these uh, grooves and this I call it the electric slide, and um, so that that one is right in there in between. It's very husky the way Chicago tenor sound is. Um, we came out with a new model last year that's pretty cool. It's called the Giant. It's in the shape of hard rubber, but it's actually anodized aluminum. So it's metal. Metal mouthpieces are usually constructed in a smaller, slender shape. That shape is part of the sound of mouthpieces because your chamber becomes smaller when it's slimmer. In a, inversely, in a hard rubber mouthpiece, your chamber, your mouth is opened up, so your sound is a little bit warmer. So with this giant, I'm getting kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, big big chamber in the mouthpiece and your chamber but metal plays differently and I'm able to manufacture it a little differently and, and a little more accurately and thinner rails and things uh, also it looks just like a hard rubber mouthpiece we give it a matte finish we hard anodize it and the thing we call it stealth metal because when kids nowadays come into their college lesson that first lesson if they have it a brass mouthpiece, if they have a gold mouthpiece, 
90% of professors will say, get that out of here and get a hard rubber mouthpiece. They want to be, I think the professors want to be starting from neutral or something. But it's not a fair prejudice, actually, I don't think. But we're going to get, we get this mouthpiece under the radar <laughs> with the stealth metal, and they'll never know it. And it's a, it's a really cool mouthpiece. It has a big sound. So, you know, people ask me about my favorites and stuff, but, you know, I live with them for usually almost a year when I'm prototyping. So, and then I'm out on gigs with them, which is, which is great to be able to be out there. And I honestly don't know how other companies, if they don't have the buck stops here guy, I don't know how they do it. Because if you try and make a mouthpiece through consensus, everybody's going to have a different opinion. Who do you, where does this buck stop? And I feel fortunate. I always played mouthpieces that weren't too out. They were mouthpieces that everybody liked. So, so what I'm what I'm liking is not going to be far from, you know, what people like. And uh, I'm able to say, yeah, the buck stops here, and I'm able to push and push until we beat what we're trying to beat. How did you build up the uh, dealer base? Well, st Nam, you know, starting with Nam early on. So I've been. This must be my 13th year out of a 15 year. Um, but it's really happened organically because, you know, I wanted, I wasn't greedy about growth. I, I let, wanted the growth to be organic and hopefully I can st stay pace with it. I've seen guys put all the building blocks in place, like the marketing, the great models, the good website, do everything, and then didn't get enough staff. I didn't get enough employees to, to make it happen and crash. So, so we've built slowly, um, and we built our dealer base slowly. Uh, and now, you know, we, we're at, I think, 11 employees, um, but we're, we're now just about ready to really start. I never had a salesperson. And uh, so I never had reps. I, it was all kind of people coming to us. I was never actually calling dealers. Hey, have you heard of Jody Jazz? Uh, and so it, it has come organically. It's a pretty good, pretty good network now. We never use distributors either. We've always gone direct. And uh, we always wanted to have a system in place that we made sure that a local music store never got beat by an online thing. That's what we try to do. Because we feel, when you ask about music stores, we feel they're such, they're a little cathedral. They're so important. And uh, it's so important for people to go touch and try. And uh, so we want to always cherish those, those places. Uh, so now we're at NASMD, so that's a, a conscious effort. Uh, to be in front of these, these really important dealers that, that service the schools. We purposely are hard rubber. I could charge double for it, and I would, I'm positive I would make as much money, if not more. I'd sell less, but I would make more. I'd, and people would be totally happy to pay that from, from our brand. Because when I tell them the price, they go, oh, oh great. Um, but we're purposely staying a, under a point to be competitive with the brands that the high school kids are, are buying. I want to be in that market. And uh, I want to be in those stores, not necessarily a high-end boutique. So, so it's coming. I'm, I'm very happy with, with our progress. It's right on track for me. You know, I checked out your website and um, some of the things that you guys have been doing. And one of the things that occurred to me is that you also seem to be a bit of a... Uh, a student of the history of these mouthpieces too. You kind of know where you come from, which I think is really cool. And I wonder, what is your perspective on how the mouthpiece has developed over time? For me, people want to think about this thing of total hand work and that, that part of it. But let's say if we do that we're really only going to be able to get a certain amount of mouthpieces out, and they're all going to be different. Now, we do handwork in every single mouthpiece, but we, 
we take a lot of the a lot of it out as well. So because I, I every time I play test my mouthpieces, I go to the benchmark. Or every time you know I'm, I'm prototyping, I, I'm got a goal. So I get a benchmark in manufacturing. You always have one that's somewhat, for some reason, a little better than the others. It's the benchmark, and you have to play that. I want everybody to get the benchmark. I don't think it's fair not to get the benchmark. It drives me nuts. And uh, I've heard other guys, maybe some old timers, say, "Well, some people like resistance, some people like free, some people like this and that," and they just could go and find them out of the same model. It's the same model, but there's variation. Um, and I don't buy that. You know, I, I want you to know what you're coming f to me for and get it. It's, for example, the teacher has his, and he says to the student, go get it. And then the student comes back, the teacher tries it. Oh, <laughs> that's not it. So these little, it's so fine that the changes that can be made uh, in a mouthpiece that that can affect it. In uh, older technology, let's say, and I'm not saying it's uh, obsolete at all, but in molding technology in a mouthpiece, you have to make the mold kind of crude, not so close to the finished thing, so that you can accommodate different tip openings. And you do all kind of handwork on this thing to get it down. And when there's that much handwork, you're going to have that type of variation. So, so for me, I'm about having a benchmark and letting you, you play that benchmark. And you could still, a uh, super sensitive player, let's say on the level in the equivalent of Tiger Woods in golf, if they hand him 10 of his clubs, here's your eight, he is going to feel the weight difference on all of them. They are super sensitive players, but there are others that I'll, I'll have my benchmark, like I tried this with the Jet Tenor and I've got my benchmark here, and then I've got my ones up at the demos that I know are excellent, but I feel that Matt might not be, I was just testing, and a great player he was playing, and I said, hey, try this one now. He loves that one, the demo. Try this one. It didn't feel any difference. So mm. not everybody can feel, I think, what I feel, and I've played more mouthpieces than probably anybody. I, I think it might be true because I play test everything. And... Uh, so, so um, I'm obsessive about this thing that I want you to get the best I can make. Another thought um, that you brought up when you were talking about your model, the giant. Is it called yes, the giant? The giant, yeah. Which I love the name, by the way. Um, well, it reminded me of Coltrane. Right. Yeah. And giant steps and. Yeah, me that's, too. Yeah. That's, that's totally where I got. So, a uh, metal mouthpieces. They are always smaller. Smaller, right. And they is, usually are. And is there was there a historic reason for that? I mean, is it because they're trying to get a certain sound? Because that, that the I don't material know. material changed? That, or? that I don't know. Yeah, um, I always wondered about that. Maybe, you know, there is a, there's a vibration thing in a mouthpiece, and a lot of it comes from the beak. If you make the beak too thick, the mouthpiece starts to deaden. If you make it too thin, it starts to sound plasticky in a way mm. but I don't know the answer to that um, it's a good question I mean the French guys were were making metal mouthpieces long ago so um, I'd have to go back and uh, I have an old French wooden mouthpiece that I use to to demonstrate to people the difference that a mouthpiece can make and this thing is it's big it's huge chamber inside it's very closed and and I can you can hardly hear me. Then I put on a current student mouthpiece, and to me, it still feels like there's a huge sock in the bell. And then I put on our hard rubber, and it's boom. And, and I'm saying, you see, that's what your students need in, in a jazz band because they're coming with a student mouthpiece or a classical mouthpiece. And I did an ad recently that I've wanted to do for a long time. It shows a, a high school sax section. The lead tenor player is playing actual lemon. <laughs> Next to her, there's a Nerf football on the on the neck. One guy has a shoe on the neck, and it's not all mouthpieces are created equal. It's trying to get the point across to band directors. You're yelling at that sax section to give you more juice, give you more volume, 
they're competing against electric guitar, electric bass, drummer, electric keyboard, brass players that can't play as high as they need to, so they're playing louder. And they're saying, sax section, come on. But they're playing uh, mouthpieces that don't help them project. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the point of that ad. That's we we, cool. we uh, showed it off at TMEA this year and got a lot of laughs. <laughs> Uh, thinking about the the facing where the reed sits, and that's one of the elements that you were talking about. It's very finite. If you alter it a little bit, you can actually do a lot in terms of the change of yes. the sound. Yes. Well, the sound is not going to change as much from the facing curve. So the, the the reed sits on a table, and then the mouthpiece curves away, and there's an open window. So that curve is going to affect a lot of how this thing blows um, and how the reed responds in all the registers. Some mouthpieces you can play and it's going good and going good. You get up to a certain register, all of a sudden, whoop, what happened? It dies out. It's got like a dead spot or something. So that reed really wants to vibrate nicely all the way. Um, and there are different curves. There's a curve that can accentuate the high notes, make your altissimo very easy. The jet, for example, is my first short curve. And I'm playing notes like Lenny Pickett that I never played before. And I'm having a blast. <laughs> it's fun. I have a little steady Thursday and Friday, uh, Friday and Saturday at a Cuban restaurant. And I shouldn't be playing that loud and that high at that restaurant. <laughs> but I am, and people are going, Ooh. <laughs> every time I go way up high. and I mean, way up high. So, so the facing curve can help. And a longer curve can accentuate the bottom a little bit, make it freer. Uh, it's trying to match the curve to the particular mouthpiece of the chamber. What changes the sound more is the inside and shapes of the chamber. And uh, the outside can change it some as well. So what have you gotten out of um, going to the NAMM show? How has that helped your business? It's NAMM show is not... A, for us, not a real closer show because people are sent there with the mandate, do not buy anything. And otherwise they'd come home with <laughs> too much inventory, they'd be, they'd be in trouble. So, and the people who do close are the ones that give tremendous specials. And they try and book their year from that. We don't do that. And again, because I'm not, I'm not, you know, that hungry for dealers, new dealers. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I've been working slow and steady. And so it but it has of course got my dealer network. Sometimes it takes 5 years to for people to kind of walk by you one year, talk to you another year, think about it. I'm thinking I'm on the fence. Sometimes they're going to have to hear from another dealer. Oh yeah, we're killing with Jody Jazz. Um but all these shows I feel got to be there. No question. And uh I've learned some things I I I love those university sessions, but, but I can't get to them, <laughs> you know, because uh, I, I need to be in the booth. But the NAMM show is important. Just industry connections are very important. So a lot of people take that for granted because somebody might be asking the Con Selmer guy, what, what, what's in mouthpieces these days? And, and they've seen me around and they've heard me play and they, you know, so they might say, well, I hear good things about Jody Jazz. Um, and that's part of NAM that you don't think about, maybe. Hmm. Uh, we, we just went to the summer show uh, for the first time because it's not known to be a horn show. But it was worth it. It was worth it. So we're going to go again. Well, this has been great. I really appreciate hanging out with you. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks so much for asking. Cool. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Let's think about doing a part two one of these days. Anytime. See how you, how you progress. How's that? Uh, great. Right on. All Thank right. you, Jody. Thank I you. I really appreciate it.